Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. It's me, Dave Wakeman. This episode today is a, how do I say it, scorcher. Uh, this one I'm very excited to share with you, and it's taken me a little bit of time to get it edited because I was having a problem with um, my equipment. But it's Colin Lewis, who is Ireland's most famous marketer. Uh, that's the joke, at least, because as Colin will explain to you, uh, most of the time, he is the only marketer that people know from Ireland. So this is a really great one. Um, the planning for this podcast started a while back, and um, I'm glad we really had a, we had a chance to talk. It was awesome, um, and as like has happened as has happened a lot lately. It was great to get a chance to talk to somebody even before we did the podcast, and there's so much great stuff that we talked about before the podcast. I feel bad, um, but one of the big things that we talked about on this episode is we talked about um, a couple articles that Colin has written for Marketing Week over the last couple months about career roadmaps for marketers. Uh, We talk about Colin's experience finding himself laid off through no fault of his own on several different occasions. And Colin has some really, really great and insightful ideas on how people can come back and not just come back, but come back better than they were before. Um, he shared an article with me that is probably that he calls a guide, like a workbook that's probably about 20 pages long. And it's just amazing. Um, in its coverage of the psychological impacts, the emotional impacts, um, obviously the financial impacts, you know, uh, how to think through everything about where you are and what you're struggling with at the time. As this pandemic has continued on, uh, ideas like this have become more and more important. And, um, you know, looking at the world that we're living in, we're still living in an environment where it's uncertain when things maybe have will have a chance to come back. We'll have a chance to become, for lack of a better term, normal again. Uh, And a lot of people who listen to this podcast regularly are probably confronting, you know, what do I do next? You know, how do I deal with? with this industry that I've been in or, or this area that I've focused on for so long that I don't know when it's going to come back. And so Colin's great. Uh, Colin is, a, I think, primarily he might consider one of his better skills to be a teacher, and that really comes through in this episode. It, um, it's just powerful. Um, but we also talk about some other more fun things. We talk about how to become a T-shaped person, which is really, really cool. Uh, we talk about Colin's experience in hospitality and travel. We talk about, obviously, um, career development. We talk about um, psychological aspects of, you know, working and career development. We talk about focusing on things you like. We talk about hard and soft skills. Um, this is really, really great. Um, this is one that I was really excited to have the chance to do. It's one I'm really hopeful that is going to have an impact on all of you. Um, before I get to Colin, let me remind you to check out um, my Talking Tickets newsletter, which is my weekly newsletter dedicated to the world of live entertainment, sports, uh, all those things. You can get it at talkingtickets.substack.com. Each week, it has five stories from the week uh, with an analysis and some action items. Uh, this week, because I'm recording this on Thursday, the 8th of October, Um, I'm covering a report that showed Pearl Jam drove $58 million into the Seattle economy during two home shows in 2018 and what that'll teach us about how to generate revenue and get our businesses back online after the pandemic. I talk about um, the NFL. I talk about um, Major League Baseball being in the bubble. I look at the some of the great stuff that Baker Richards is doing with the cultural restart project uh, in the UK. There's a whole bunch of great stuff. So check it out. Talkingtickets.substack.com. I would point you towards the, my friends at the, we will recover project. That's we will recover dot live uh, Martin and Anar from activity stream. And the whole team have put together this really, really tremendous uh, website and resource for folks. We have a couple of webinars that I'm working on putting up right now. Over the next couple of weeks, that will focus on uh, sales funnels, um, 
customer focus, reorienting your marketing strategies, reorienting your sales strategies for after the pandemic. They're going to be great. So we will recover dot live. Uh, go for, check out my friends Booking Protect. That's bookingprotect.com forward slash home, where you can find out about offering your guest refund protection now. The blog is great. Um, we're putting up some stuff there. Uh, I'm working on a piece about digital technology and digital tools going forward that will help you no matter um, pandemic or post-pandemic or n- we forgot about the pandemic. Uh, so there's some really great stuff there. Check it out. If you have been thinking or have not thought about offering refund protection to your audience, maybe now's a good time to visit that conversation and revisit that conversation. So reach out to Kat, Simon, uh, Kath, anybody involved at Booking Protect. Uh, it's a great, you know, obviously huge f- friends of mine, uh, great people. Check them out. But back to Colin. You know, I th- I'm so excited for you to hear this conversation. Uh, this applies no matter where you are or what you you think you know about um, turning your career around or rethinking your job and your career when you're in a rut or when you find yourself like we're all, all of us are dealing with in some shape or form in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, it's it's so powerful. And Colin's such a great teacher. And this is just such such an awesome episode. So without anything else for me, here's my conversation with Colin Lewis. Um, but forgive any glitches in the audio because that's on my end. And hopefully that doesn't detract from Colin's uh, wisdom and, you know, just uh, incredible thoughts. They are. Um, uh, well, I hope so. I hope so. I hope we, we've been talking so much before the podcast that I feel I've exhausted everything that's in my brain. But I think we'll try and give it a good bash. Well, uh, I mean, I think we both have a lot we can say. And because this thing got cut off, I'm going to say it until again. This is Colin Lewis, who I'm super excited to have the chance to talk to here. Um, this is going to be great. We probably left about 35 or 40 minutes of uh, bonus material that won't be re- released because we didn't record it. Um, but it's so great to talk to you because you are um, – what is the joke that they make about you, the most famous marketer in Ireland? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I get, I do get the, yeah, the, I do get my, you know, my ass kicked over that one. I can tell you from my friends here who live in Ireland, they're just like, get out of here when they hear that. But I happen to be based in Ireland, but a lot of my stuff I do is internationally. So anybody internationally goes and says, "You're the only one I know," so I'll call you the most famous marketer in Ireland. Well, that was like the BBC. Re- um, I guess it was last year. They uh, they introduced me on a program as the king of tickets. And I have not, <laughs> and I may never live that down, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. to be known, right, Colin? I mean, you got to have a distinct yeah. brand in the market, is what I tell everybody. And luckily, well, it's, the it's, BBC is giving you about not being known. Yeah, well, the alternative about not being known is that what Oscar Wilde said that the worst thing about nothing talked about it or whatever. The everybody knows the phrase. I can't even remember it correctly. That's ex- I would rather be uh, ridiculed and known than not ridiculed than not be known at all because um, not being yeah. known at all means I'm not getting paid. That's <laughs> that's <laughs> the way I viewed it. Um, now I wanted to uh, have you on because you know we've we've been joking about doing a podcast for quite some time, and I, I think the joke you might not even remember this was one time I said oh, I'm going to start this podcast only if Colin will do it called below average intelligence and you said i will not do this unless you call it above average intelligence so um <laughs> this could be the very first episode of above average intelligence um but you're one of the <laughs> you're one of the uh, one of the smartest marketing writers i know um if people haven't don't know marketing week in your column they should definitely check it out um but i wanted to ask you about some stuff um around marketing and strategy because you work with uh, primarily with open jaw and one of the great things is, is you're focused on hospitality and e-commerce. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are regular listeners to this come from the world of entertainment and sports. There's a, I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. And so I wanted to have you on to talk about that. But then you also have covered your, your experience of reinventing yourself, um, developing your expertise that I think is also applicable and helpful to people right now. So again, all jokes aside, thank you for doing yeah. this because I think this is going to be awesome. But let me start out with I can I can oh. I'll tell you for the audience just to make sure that they're not kind of snapping off straight away. Is I have a background in travel, but I've also a background in e-commerce, and I've worked 
for half my career internationally in Asia, Australia, the UK, and a little bit in my home turf as well here in Ireland. So I've got a wide range of experience, but I kind of focused in, and I know Dave's going to talk to me about this, but I've focused in on a few things that are uh, quite specific verticals. And uh, you'll hear about how that paid off and, and, and maybe isn't paying off. So that kind of sets the scene, Dave. Yeah, no, that I think that's great. See, you you could have your very own podcast because you do a better job of introducing <laughs> people. <laughs> but I want to start out by talking about uh, this idea of marketing. And we were talking about before we jumped on um, about strategy. And you put it in the notes that we were sharing back and forth about the idea of practical marketing. And then we talked about strategy and demystifying strategy. I think you and I share a common belief that the you know, strategy is the most important thing about a business. And that a lot of the challenges businesses were finding themselves in before the pandemic were built on putting tactics before strategy. And that the only way through the pandemic and to be successful on the other side is to take a step back and look at the big picture, the strategic picture before you start focusing on either the tactics or the marketing or anything else. For our audience, because we talk, we talked about this. Could you define strategy in a way that maybe you would if you were talking to somebody to help people understand what we're talking about when we're talking about strategy? Well, the first thing I want to say is, um, before I talk about definitions, is everybody, and I'm including myself, um, gets confused with with strategy and and what it actually is. It's because one of these words is thrown around, and that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And and I'll show you uh, by just asking the next question next few questions to show you how you can get confused so i'm going to just listen to your, observe your own reaction when i say these words okay so first first statement what is strategy and then the second one what is a strategy what's in a strategy what is the strategy what goes into a strategy and what makes a good strategy that's seven different sentences all in a row, all that mean completely different things. And all I did was change a definite and an indefinite article in the statement. So it's really, you know, it's one of these very, very subtle words. So as a result, we all have different meanings uh, of, what, of what we think when we say the word strategy. And I think the best one uh, that we've seen over the last 10 years, because uh, I've read, written a lot and read a lot about strategy. And the best one that I recommend to people to think through is the good strategy, bad strategy definition by Richard Rommelt, who is the USC professor of a strategy. And he just says, a strategy is a coherent set of analysis and, and, and policies that respond and actions that respond to a challenge. Now, the reason I like that particular um, definition of strategy as being uh, something that is designed to deal, a way to deal with a challenge, is that speaks exactly to our problem right now, uh, which is the COVID-19 world. So if we just think about you know, all these other amorphous, abstract definitions of what strategy is that we hear out there, what I want to do is just really make it clear to people to say, if you just think of strategy as a way, a designing a way, deal with the challenge. If you just leave it at that, then you will really understand what strategy is, because that's the thing. It's the thing to work out as a response to a challenge. Now, that's my definition. I have one step that just is kind of like the Venn diagram between a strategy and one other topic, and it's this notion of diagnosis. So if you have a pen and paper, or you have a visual in your mind, what I want you to do is just think about this word, Diagnosis first, strategy the second. Because what you're doing with diagnosis, you're defining or framing what the problem is. And that's really where the issue occurs, Dave, is this notion that people are not doing the correct diagnosis. And obviously, through the world of COVID, it's very difficult to, to get the correct diagnosis. But what I want you to frame it in people's minds, strategy way is, strategy is, 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 is a response to a challenge and it starts with good diagnosis. Yeah, this is um, the diagnosis piece is, is super important. It's anytime I start on a project with anybody, I probably bore people to tears almost with my focus on asking them why questions. And um, Zoe Skamen was on a couple weeks back and we were talking about it. she uses, I think it's the five why method. Um, yep. and, and, you know, but I was like, I think if you don't identify and you don't frame the challenge the right way, 
it sends you off in all of these unproductive different areas. And, you know, the diagnosis is just so essential. Um, so looking at it now, right, you talked about the COVID-19 world. You know, how how would you walk somebody through looking at, you know, diagnosing a problem? Because I think that, the you know, COVID is obviously the unifying thing, but a lot of times I, th I think people don't even know how to start, right? Because the, the challenge we're facing is so overwhelming for so many people. You know, I, I, the way to, I think to answer this, uh, David, is to make it real for us all, make it real to everybody, rather than some sort of abstract discussion about strategy on the battlefield or strategy in the, uh, you know, in the boardroom. I'm going to make it real. And the strategy grand strategy. Around, Alan, come on, yeah, grand, grand strategy. strategy. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where I'm kind of pushing the, pushing the minions around a board kind of thing. No, no, I'm just going to make it real. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about applying strategy to your own career, to your own kind of thing. I'm, I'm conscious that many people listen to this podcast and, you know, friends and family that I know as well are uh, struggling career-wise. And so I'm going to make it real in that context, applying strategy to your career. Now, remember I said a second ago, strategy is about de designing a way of dealing with challenge. Well, in this case, what's our challenge? Our challenge is, uh, uh, do I get, how do I get a job? How do I you know, go get something new? How do I create a new business because I'm furloughed, because I don't have anything to do right now because I've been unemployed because of COVID? Or how do I just completely reinvent myself because the industry I'm in is gone? Now, there are a direct parallel statement between the business that you're in and the business that I know quite well because the airline business and the travel business is 30 to 40% smaller than it was a year ago. Right. There's thousands, tens of thousands of pilots who are gone out of jobs and possibly many of them will never actually work as a pilot again. So the two businesses are inextricably linked. They're both leisure and related to leisure anyway. And so where do we start? And the core, remember I said the kernel, the core of what you want to do with any sort of strategy, and this is where if you have a pen and paper in front of you, you can write down, is the diagnosis, there's a kind of policy you want to create around that, and, and, there's, and, the, and the actions that you're going to do, okay? And that's typically we call tactics, actions, okay? And we mix them all up. So what I want to do is go and say, what, what, what are we really doing? What's really going on? And, 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 and that's really about defining or framing the challenge. And the, the, the guy I talked about, Richard Rommelt, who's created the book, um, or written the book, um, A Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, he says, strategists engage in an internal quest for insight and an internal struggle against their own myopia. And this is, this is the thing. Uh, Daniel Goleman writes about it this in his book, uh, Vitalize Simple Truth, which is that we're just blind to ourselves. We literally are, we're blind to ourselves totally in so many respects, and we're struggling against our own myopia. So what I want to do is just basically, you've got to know your strengths, know your weaknesses, uh, know the skills that make you a great product, but don't fool yourself. Okay. Now, when you're out in the world doing your job for what you're doing, yeah, maybe you might be able to get away with fooling a few people. But when it comes to getting a job and creating your future career, the one person you can't fool is fool yourself. And, uh, you know, it leads me to this point that, that I kind of probably sure will touch on again, Dave, is this notion of what I call um, unique capabilities. And this is the one where you've got to be very frank with yourself and say, what are the things that I'm really good at? And they could be either you know, very specific, like I'm very good at Google AdWords or I'm, I'm very good at presenting or whatever. And they're very hard skills, if you will. And then there's stuff that maybe is unique to you, but is kind of a little harder to capture, which is you're very good at maybe reading other people's minds or diagnosing situations, or you're very good at being um, objective about situations. But knowing all of those and capturing that in your diagnosis of where you are what you can do in your life is 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 the best thing. I mean, you know, I'm going to wrap up on this point because I can definitely talk about it forever. But the reason why I really want to ram home about um, being frank with yourself, it's 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 when it's because you know, otherwise you'll fall into what I call the Brad Pitt problem, which is I can fool myself to say that I look like Brad Pitt and I'm six foot four and I've got a full head of hair. I can believe that if I really want. But when the rubber hits the road, it turns out not to be true. So don't go and believe you're Brad Pitt. Okay? Make sure that you know your strengths, know your weaknesses, know your unique abilities, and don't fool yourself. So that's no, your diagnosis, Dave. That's where it starts. 
<laughs> and, and yeah, uh, you said, do I have a sheet of paper? And I've already moved on to my second sheet of paper because you, uh, <laughs> you've given me so much already. Um, you know, so one of the things, and there's a great article that I hope, may, well, there's a couple of great articles and I'm going to tweet them out and I'll probably put link, try to put links to them um, where you talked about your, the process in written form and you laid this out. Um, but the yeah. question I want to ask is, you know, geez, now I'm like forgetting the question because there's so many different ones to ask you. But the question that, that, that out of this kernel of diagnosis and understanding is what is what role as people are you know dealing with things now and they understand like, hey, look, I'm looking at this world. I've got these hard skills that I'm good at. I've got these soft skills. I'm great. Um, you know, pulling them together and unifying them into some kind of like focused them I don't even know, you know, um, brand, I guess, for lack of a better term, you know, what part does that play? You know, what, you know, how does like when they pull it together, what does that mean? Like, how does that play out for people? So, so, well, it's a great question. Okay. So I, again, I'm the professor of harsh reality reaching through this, reaching through this podcast saying, don't kid yourself. But the second part, not kidding yourself is don't kid yourself about the world. Okay. Now, the harsh reality in the world is that people do judge you on the background of the school you went to, the previous universities, sorry, the previous brands you worked for, the previous companies you worked for. That's a fact of life. Okay. It's not fair. It's not really right. I 100% agree. Okay. But that is what's going to happen. So that's why you again have to be brutally frank with yourself and say, okay, given where I am, with the background I have, what is the sort of direction of travel I can do? But before you make your decision on direction of travel, and, and I'll talk about direction of travel in a second, is what I want you to do is on your sheet of paper, you're drawing a line across and you're drawing a, a line of the set of things which you're kind of good at. OK, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm OK at doing accounts. I'm OK at putting together spreadsheets. I'm, I'm OK at this. And, but I'm really good. And then so you draw a line below that where I call creating um, as what's known as a T-shaped person. And what you want to do is start mounting your skills up where you combine them to have be not just a T-shaped person, but a pie. And as in PI 3.14 pie, or maybe more on top of that. And so then you have a thing that you can go and say, right, I've got a framework. I know the things I'm good at, but I know the things I'm really excellent at. And so the reason I want you to create this framework in your mind is that then you can start using this as both the direction of travel, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also for you to encapsulate the things you're good at when you meet people. You can create your elevator pitch much better that way. You can create the, the latte pitch, as they call it. Not that I think people are having lattes anymore, but your virtual latte pitch um, much better by saying, you know, my name is Colin Lewis. Uh, my name is Dave Wakeman. I'm, uh, you know, I'm kind of background in X, Y, Z and ABC and, you know, but a lot of great experience. Well, what I'm really great at is this, and I'm an expert in this, and I'm an expert in this. But the reason to do that is this is what people are hiring. People are hiring for skills. They're not hiring you because you're a nice guy or gal. They're hiring you for your skills. And again, I don't want to kind of rudely interrupt you, but there's a lot of people who are not very nice people who are hired because they got the right skills. So disavow yourself of the notion of being nice and focus on the skills and always be what I call skill stacking so that people can go and say, wow, this person's got a lot of skills. They're the person I want to draw from. Because knowing your skills gives you the direction of travel. It gives you the options that you could go and then go after. Without knowing the skills, you don't have the options. And without being realistic about yourself, you can't work out your options. So that's why I use my next phase after the skills discussion is this direction of travel. Okay, I know this. So therefore, I could think about, so uh, let's use um, sport as the example, because I'm a sports fan, but I'm a particular type of sports fan, I'm a moderation fan, okay? So Colin, I've got this skill, my name's Colin, I've got this skill, I'd like to work in motor racing. That's the direction of travel. But maybe that could actually be working at a circuit. Or maybe that could be working in Formula One. Maybe that could be working in NASCAR. Maybe that could be working in an e-commerce business that sells car parts and sells motorsport parts online. Do you see how I've just created the direction of travel pretty quickly? And then I start looking at each of those directions of travel as to whether there's some sort of fit that I should really go after. Does that sound real, Dave? 
No, that sounds great. And I, one point I want to emphasize for people is when you were talking about focusing on the direction, but before that, when you were talking about becoming the pie-shaped person, people are hiring yeah. you for the outcomes you create. So yeah. a lot of times people will get tied down by their job description, or like you said, the brands they work for or the school they went yeah. to. Um, but focus on the outcomes you produce, right? So me, I am very, very good. I am as good as I, th I think as it gets at figuring out ways to, for people to make money. That's my, that's my complete gig. And that's why yeah. people bring me in. So f make it that simple for people, because I think that's a super important point and you can miss it, right? Because you kind of get used to like the day-to-day -day jobs and the boxes you're ch checking, but focus on how that has an impact on the business. I think that's super important for people to recognize. You know, that, 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 that one there, and the fact that you, you, uh, you've tapped into something that I really like there, Dave. Well, I love it all, but like there's something there for our audience to tune into there. You said, I know how to make money for people. And that's your kind of pie or your, your, your T-shaped thing. Um, but there's a second reason why that's amazing, okay? It's where the market is at right now. It's where what people want to hear. And there's a related word to that, and it's growth. Yeah. I, so if you are a sort of person that can walk in the door, hi, my name is Dave. My name's Dave. What I do is grow business. My name's Dave. What I do is I can, you know, great, create revenues immediately overnight. And here's how. That's what people want to hear. But also, hopefully it's true as well. And in your case, it is true, obviously. So using <laughs> kind of very concrete language like that, it's, it's very concrete language. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so people, it took people a long like time. concrete language. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, that took a long time for me to get comfortable. And this is, I think, the mindset thing was one of the things we've been going back and forth. It took me a long time to just be comfortable saying, hey, look, whatever I do, I, I like you said, there's some not nice people I can go, I can be a complete jerk or a pain in the ass. But the thing is, is like, I will make you money. That's just like been proven over and over and over again. I, I mean, I've walked into b multiple businesses and doubled their revenues in 90 days. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's just like almost um, the price of business at this point for when I walk into honest, these things. But, but well, for you your know, audience, I think, but I want you to tune yeah. into those words there. You use the words double the business in 90 days. And it, they, they, they capture a part of a person's mind much more powerfully than you know, I'm really good at developing business. Yeah, you, you've really encapsulated it right there. Oh, yeah. And I, the only reason I bring that up is not to toot my own horn, because Lord knows people hear this hear from me far too much. It's th to let people understand that, like, hey, you have to sell yourself because nobody else is going to do it for you. And I think that sometimes people, they want to try to come in the side door. And, you know, you and, you and me both, we know that, um, you know, if you're not blowing your own horn, if you're not, you know, out there pushing your own ideas, there's nobody else going to do it for you. Everybody else, it's a competitive world. And to win, I have to be out there selling myself. I want people to yeah. recognize you have to do that and that, like, it's going to evolve. And you probably have to push to the extreme edge to stand out in the world today. It's a little bit more than even five years ago. Actually, I want to touch on a point there, Dave, which I, I, a lot of people have reached out to me for a series of articles I've written over the last um, three three or four months for Marketing Week. And I, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. I, I, the articles were the easiest to write. Normally, I'm like, you know, kind of pouring over these articles and just like it's kind of killing me to write the articles. Okay, These ones just kind of pour out of it because a lot of these experiences that I'm writing about were personal experiences. And I've been through these. These are not things I read from books. This is actually bitter personal experience that have kind of combined together to codify for people. And people all over the world reach out to me. One particular gentleman reached out to me and he had worked for a very well-known international um, uh, uh, spirits brand. I mean, literally one of the best known in the world. And he said a very interesting thing to me. He said, you know, I, I really realized I was just playing this game within this organization. I was kind of totally internally focused and I didn't realize there was a different world out there. But, you know, I'm actually now six months now where I had, and he hadn't been working for six months. He said, I'm actually okay with that because I realized I was too sheltered and I wasn't robust. I wasn't resilient. And I wouldn't go back to that anymore because I look at myself and go, who was that person? I was just so sheltered and I was playing those internal political games. And now I feel much more robust and much more resilient and much more capable of facing the world. And this was a guy who was unemployed. Yeah. So it's a kind of a little game that goes on. Some people say 
um, uh, that, 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 that these things, that these tough things that have happened to us um, are the best thing that's ever happened to them. To them. Now, I, I'm not quite there myself. I, just, I haven't quite got that much religion. But what I would say is some of the things that happened to me, and I know some of the things that happened to you, Dave, we would say I wouldn't wish them on my worst enemy. But I've still come out the far side and I'm still more resilient and I've learned from. So that is one positive thing I'd really like people to kind of tune into is that it's, it's tough going at the moment. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, we're all going through a tough phase, but you are not going to believe your resilience now in the future. You, you just simply aren't. Yeah, that, that part about not wishing this on anybody is absolutely true. And the idea that um, it, this sucks and that we'll get through it. Uh, and that it's going to make us better on the other side. It's super important. I talk about the Stockdale paradox quite often because my friend Simon from Leeds, he called me up. He goes, I want to share this video with you and I want to tell you about it. And it's true. It's like, we will get through this. I know it's going to suck until I do, but that doesn't give me the right to curl up into a ball and not to continue to face the world. And, you know, that's a super important um, lesson, you know, and I, I think I speak for me and you when I say that, like, look, if somebody needs somebody to reach out to and some advice or some ideas, we're both here for people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's what I do. I'd say you know, <laughs> more often than you, you you would believe is just people get in touch and I go, no, this is the thing. And uh, yeah, it, 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 you should do it. Uh, you can't bottle it up. You, you should choose the right person to talk to. Sometimes, you know, I do say to people, you can't go talk to your mother, you can't go talk to your wife or your, or your, or your, or your husband because they're not in the same thing. You know, it's the same thing is not happening to them. And sometimes it just really helps to talk to a third party who is both objective but empathetic, you know, because uh, the, the thing that you're going through it's very, very difficult for others to tune into, particularly if you're unemployed and the other person you're talking to has not been unemployed. <laughs> God knows, I have friends of mine who are still going, when am I going to get a real job, even though I've been working over 20 years? Because they just can't tune into the fact that my career is different to theirs. Yeah, I and I think, too, the important thing about this is, like, you also want people to understand that there, there's a growth process and that, like, whatever you did before, it doesn't define you. It's, you know, you're just evolving yeah, to the next version of yourself. Yeah. It's, you yeah. know, and it's super yeah. important for people to recognize that there's no right or wrong answer. There's just a answer that's right for right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, if you've, if you've defined your directions of travel, you're getting some of the answers, you know, you're getting, you're starting to work out your, your opportunities. Like, uh, you know, remember I talked about my, you know, as, a, as I always say to anybody who's, stupid enough to listen to me, I was going to say, my dream job is working in Formula One. Um, and if, of course, if my dream job is working in Formula One um, and I don't get it, in theory, I would be very disappointed. Yeah. Um, so that's why I, should, I need to, one needs to work out one's direction of travel is there's lots of options if I want to work in motorsport and just work out those and then say, right, okay, what are my opportunities and what the skills I've worked out to map to those opportunities. And that's where I can start kind of seeing, creating a sort of policy of what I could do. So that's, that's really the, the, the kind of third part of, of strategy. That's why I speak it like that. And I, you know, that's why I want to circle back to this notion of directions of travel once you know your skills and once you've been realistic with, your, with yourself. Yeah, and I know that the reason it, your desire to work in Formula One is one of the key drivers of coming on the podcast today because we have to sell you to the Formula One audience. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I'd be very disappointed, Dave. And uh, <laughs> the, my telephone number, if the chief executive of Formula One is is, uh, is listening to this podcast, is one eight hundred Colin for you. Okay, yeah. you dial that number. Answer twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. But I, I do think though that like this uh, this opens the door to a, a topic that I know that we both wanted to talk about, which is, um, and it's going to be very important for the people who listen that are in the theater or performing arts or concerts, as equally as it'll be important for the people who are in sports business. And this is the idea that you want, like, have been working on with a friend of yours around building a platform and understanding yeah. that your business should be a platform and that the platform opens you up to greater opportunities than you might imagine now in the way that the business is set up. Can you... Tell us, you know, define yeah. the platform business from your point of view and explain to us, because I think this might be a unique way of putting it for a lot of people. 
So what, the third part of strategy or the fourth part of strategy is the coherent actions that you're going to do and, and the things that you're going to accomplish. And, and one of the things, particularly in the arts and particularly in sports, is I say to a lot of people is think about creating your own platform. Now, when I say platform, what I mean is not, you know, uh, a literal platform. I don't mean, you know, a, a great set of Instagram following. No, 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 no. What I want to do is... Observe yourself as, say, the artist or the sportsman and you doing your craft. That's one thing. But the second thing you do is, is par- in parallel to that, you set up yourself as a, as a sort of a product, if you will, or a platform. And when I say that, what I mean is you, are, you, you, you position yourself using uh, tools such as email, tools such as social media, um, so that you can communicate to your audience. Now, let me give you much more specific because I sound too abstract when I say that. Good friends of mine are interested in the motorsport business. Um, I do give lots of advice to uh, friends of mine who are trying to break into the motorsport business. And I try to say the same thing to them as well, which is you've got to develop a platform. And they look at me blankly going, why should I bother developing a platform? And here's why. A platform makes you saleable to sponsors. A platform makes you saleable to people who want to give you money to put your show on. It it, it just works in every single way. So these young drivers who are, say, let's say 24, 25, here's what I say to them. I say, what you want to be doing is you, 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 you have to have a communication in your social media channels, which in this case, they have to do at least Instagram, if not Instagram and Twitter, given their target audience, okay? And they communicate about their activity. Last weekend, it came forth, here's what happened, you know, this thing happened and so on. And the, But they need to do it warts and all, and I'll explain why warts and all in a second. All of the things they need to be doing are communicating that they, you need to go to that person's website and you need to create your own WordPress or simple website. Why to the website? Because when they get to that website, you want to capture an email address. And we'll talk about capturing an email address in a second. And so therefore, if, I, if you have your sheet of paper in front of you, what you want to be able to do is draw one line that says website, that's channel one. Channel two is email addresses. Channel three is social media channels, which in this case is, 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 is likely to be Instagram, possibly Twitter, and maybe LinkedIn, depending on the business. For my motor racing guys, I say you should be on LinkedIn. Why? Because their target market is sponsors, business sponsors. Where are they? They're on LinkedIn. They're not on Instagram, okay? Because they tend to be older than maybe people who are running businesses. They're, on, they're not on LinkedIn. Sorry, they're not on Instagram. They're not taking pictures of their six-pack ads. They're on LinkedIn. So what you want to be doing is creating this platform. And in this platform is your website, is your selection of email addresses, and the two social media channels of your choice. What are you going to communicate in these channels? You're going to do this idea of creating value. So when my motorsport friends, I go and say, guys, you need to be telling them about what you learned that weekend, how you prepared for that weekend, and what others can learn from that. You then use that to go and thank your sponsors. And you don't treat it as a thing where you're being totally selfish talking about yourself. You know, I could have come first, but only for this guy, he knocked me off the track, I came second. No, no, no. You go and say, here's what I learned for the weekend. Here's what you could learn from that. Here's the struggles we had. Here's how we overcame them. But the whole thing is about driving people to your website. And very few of them do this, but what I want people to do is actually, if they've done their race, done their weekend, they write up a summary of that and put it on their website because it's driving traffic to that. Websites are the only thing you own. Email addresses are the only thing you own. You don't own Instagram because the algorithm can mess with it. You don't own LinkedIn because the algorithm can mess with other people are going to see your content. Only on the website, and only on the uh, email addresses are can people actually see what you do. And if you can go and say, imagine Dave Wakeman calls me up and says, Colin, I want you to sponsor me um, or, you know, go, you know, get involved and invest my next, uh, you know, a thing or go to my next show or, you know, sponsor me as a racing driver. The first question out of my mind will be, do you have your own website? And Dave said, yes, I've got DaveWakeman.com. Many people who visit that, about 2,000 people visit a week. Great, Dave, thank you. What's the size of your database? My database is 10,000 people. Great. What's the size of your Instagram following? 10,000. Great. Okay, Dave, so then you can get my messages out there. If I choose to give you money, you can go sell my products, sell my cars, sell my ideas, whatever the thing is. And 
uh, that's much more realistic than saying, hey, yeah, I've got an Instagram feed with 5,000 people and I write on it twice a week. Do you see what I'm trying to get across here, Dave? It's like you create a full platform like a business has a platform and that sort of gives you your own resilience. So your business is not just the day job of being great as an athlete or being great as an actor. It's actually also about managing and creating your platform. But do not get seduced by just being on one channel like Instagram. You've got to be on your own website and capturing email addresses. That's where the real value is. Well, I've been talking about this idea of like the e- driving people to the website and to email because you own those assets for years. Um, yep. And I would actually go one step further because you were talking about, you know, individuals in motor racing and you were talking about, um, you know, individuals. But a lot of times the teams and the venues and a lot of the other people, they're not doing that very well either. And it's no. so important no. because there's so much value that people are already creating and it just it diffuses out into the world because it's not. Um, and I have three C's for the way that you should think about your platform. It's not comprehensive, it's not coordinated, and it's not consistent. And if you don't do that, it, you're going to lose your message, right? It's you know, and I mean, you're talking about. I have a website, right? I have two email lists that I drive people towards, and I have all those social media things. And so I, you know, I track my platform size. It's valuable because. When somebody comes on and like wants to do something on the podcast, I can tell you how many people download the podcast every month, right? I can tell you how many people do this. I can tell you how many impressions you're going to get from your um, sending out an email with me. I can tell you, because I track the stuff, what works and what doesn't work in, inside of this. This is all valuable. And for people who are either a venue or a sports team, if you're not building your email list, people still use their email. I don't have the exact statistics Well, on the the notion of email lists, okay, I want everybody out there who's got this idea that social media is more powerful than email lists, okay, Um, I want to ask one question. When you're setting up a a social media account, what's the one thing you need? An email address. What's the one thing that's almost like a social security number these days? Email address. Nobody has the same email address as me and Gmail, by definition. Okay. Um, so one thing after all my talking this evening, most important thing I can tell you today is build your own list. The phrase used in direct marketing is the phrase, the money is in the list. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I have spent a whole lot more time focusing on list building lately just because it's so valuable for me, from my yeah. point of view. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 if Dave walks into me and says, Colin, give me money to go do something. And I go, where's the value creation on your side, Dave? And he says, yeah, no, it's just because it's a great project. I think you should do it, Colin. It's just great. Give me money because I'm a great person. Or B, Dave walks in the door and says, listen, I'm a mini media mogul. I'm the Rupert Murdoch of Washington, D.C., and I've got four different databases. I've got two platforms. I've got this, that, and the other. Then I'll listen. So it's kind of, obviously, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek, but one of the examples of kind of that who did this very well, uh, and it's obviously a very high end example, but it's just a bit to learn from, is what Red Bull did. And Red Bull um, were a soft drink, but then they became a media platform in and of itself. There's, there's lots of stuff on, on, on the internet where they talk about you know brands as platforms for media. It's, it's very high for looping, but the concept is not a bad concept to think through going, right, what if I actually was a, a person with my own database, with my own social media channels? And the big stars do this. You're, 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 you're Lewis Hamilton and stuff like that. They already have this. You're, you're Cristiano Ronaldo and here. Uh, not so much Leo Messi, but definitely Cristiano Ronaldo and Hamilton. But that's called well, Ronaldo by is by. like nuts with the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Ronaldo, is he the number one on Instagram? Something like that. Is, uh, I'm obviously not a Kim Kardashian person, so I can really compare and contrast there. If, if he's not, he's very, very much up there. And it, it's always surprising yeah. to me. So there's you know, somebody like Ronaldo, who has hu- a huge platform. Um, or there's other examples of bands. And I would say, like, you can go back and look at the Grateful Dead. And they started doing this stuff in the 60s when we didn't have email. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have LinkedIn. Yeah. They built a huge yeah. business around themselves, a platform business. Or even a more yeah. modern example, who's still like probably more for us old timers, Pearl Jam. All these bands, yeah. Taylor Swift, they've all done it, right? The t- and the thing is, 
it's more accessible for people now than it has ever been because oh, you can just start well, I can remember the world just when email would come in and all the rest of it. And you, you, those folks, like the, your, 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 your Pearl Jams and stuff like that, if you look at the, the Eddie Vedder and the guys, what they, what they, how they built out their career, they've built resilience in what they're doing where they're not dependent on the record company as much because they got their own platform and they got their own raving fans as well. It's, it's very, very interesting how some of these folks, so as a result, they've got longevity. And at the end of the day, that's what we're really talking about, hidden the kernel hidden between what we're talking about here is how do you you know transform yourself? How do you build resilience and how do you create something for the long term? Yeah. And, and it's interesting that we we because you know, I don't I was looking at the notes that I made. Uh, we we've kind of talked at everything that we were we we're going to do it, but we didn't talk about it through a, a, an entirely different lens than I thought we would. Because one of the challenges that people are dealing with right now is that the business model that they had before the pandemic likely is not going to be the business model that they're going to need on the other Please, side. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. I think it's important to keep something like, is my platform? Because I'm almost certain that everybody's going to go, well, we already have a platform. We're already a platform business. But they're over-relying on social media. They're over-relying on things that they're having to pay for because they can't engage with their audience in a way, meaningful way of their own choosing, which is what being a platform is. It means I control the communications with my audience because they've said, Hey, I will listen to Colin. Anything Colin Lewis says, I'm going to listen to. I'm going to, and yeah. how I'm going to prove that I'm going to give him my email address. Yeah, absolutely. There's a notion buried within this, uh, Dave, that I want to kind of, um, uh, just get people to tune into. It's this notion of value creation. Okay. And, 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 and related to it is the justice mechanism. Okay. But the value creation piece is, around that in order for us to kind of really get what we want, we've got to kind of give away a lot more value than we used to in the past. Uh, certain companies, certain people, certain individuals can get away with saying, listen, if you want anything from me, you're going to have to pay up and pay now. But they tend to be people who are monopolies or companies who are monopolies, okay? But very few of us and what we do are monopolistic, as in you can get a good enough substitute from other people. So... In the case of what we're doing is we're, we're in the value creation game. And I like to kind of go and say, give away your best stuff um, because the execution is so hard. In the game that I'm involved in, I literally give people away my best ideas. You, want, I, I, you get on a phone to me, I'll give you a thousand ideas. Why? Because I know execution is very, very hard. So I have no problem with giving away uh, my best ideas because it's in the mode of value creation. And the second thing is this notion of like you know w w justice. You know, actually, I'm dealing with one part of this in another part of my life, but we all have this. But I'm seeing a person I know has this kind of problem right now. They're expecting the world to be delivering back to them what they should have got, given the amount of work they've put in. And they're expecting other people involved in what they're doing to go and have done something, okay? And it's really tripping this person up. Like, it's really tripping them up because they're going, well, they should be doing this. They should be doing this. Colin should be doing this. And they aren't. And it's really bad. And it's kind of this, like, expectation of justice, okay? And, and I hate justice in a birthday comments, uh, I'm just using it as a metaphor. And it, it, it's tripping them up, and it's definitely stopping them getting what they want. And so that's why I want to say in the world of platform creation, what you want to be doing is always creating a kind of value. You'd be amazed what happens. And just don't necessarily look for karma and everything coming back to you. It's not quite the way the world works. So as we go into the future, there is a big haircut on prices. Certain things are going down in price. And so the person who creates more value may not get as much money for it as before, but you'll be recognized for it before. Whereas the person who in the past was trapped into this world of, well, I've got my IP, you need to be paying this price for my IP. You're not being flexible. You're not creating yourself being resilient for the future. And actually, I, I'll wrap up at this point, um, Dave, because there's, there's a point uh, I see in my own notes that Richard Rommel from, um, from, uh, uh, from the, the book Good Strategy, Bad Strategy writes about, Bad Strategy writes about. It's, it's a bit kind of pragmatic and uh, it's got maybe a bit more brutal than we want, what, want to hear. But it's about the choice of industry and, and maybe even the choice of employer if you are looking for a job. And he writes very clearly, he says, the most common path to success is not raw innovation, but skillfully riding a wave of change. 
Changes in technology, law, and consumer tastes are beyond the control of you and I, but you can harness them to your advantage. And so rather than, you know, doing, having the, you want to be like Janus. You want to be looking forward and looking backwards. And uh, in this case here, you know, 20 years ago, you could have spotted that there's something in this whole internet game. Maybe I could somehow straddle, you know, strike, get on, uh, get on board that horse and see where it brings me. Okay. And so go and make some bets, some little bets some, in your life over the next year and say, what's the big wave of change that's going to happen that I could maybe harness myself into? And COVID is bringing forward some of those, like contactless payments, uh, ticketless environments, um, uh, you know, a lot more video, a lot more visual thinking, a lot less words, uh, a lot more people training themselves, the power of training, the power of rejigging everything. So just look at the world through what's the, the wave of change that's going out there. Don't fall for the, you know, the, the hype merchants of this and add a bit of judgment around this. Kevin, Kevin Kelly's got a great book called The Inevitable, and he talks about, well, he's written three or four years ago, the things that are inevitably going to happen. And it's a really good book, and I, I, if you read it, he just goes and says, well, if you start from here, you are going to get to here. This is inevitable as a result of technology. And discovery is an example of that. I'm not going to get into detail, though, but he talks in, in really great detail how discovery is an inevitable part of where I'm going to go, helping people to discover cool new stuff. Maybe that's something that I can, uh, the audience here can help their own audience with. Yeah, no, I, um, there's three things that you brought up. You know, the first thing is, is like, there is no justice. You keep showing up. That's the, you know, yeah, the, the reward is just showing up and doing things. Um, the way I do it is because I give away a, a ton of stuff, right? But the the ideas are free, and the way I frame it is you're paying for the specificity because the way you apply those ideas is different from business to business. But like you said, the execution is is really the key as well because you can tell somebody, you know, like all the time when I'm working with sales teams, we can restructure the way that you're doing, you know, your sales team is set up. It's the follow through that matters because if, there's no yeah. secrets really for some of these things. But the most important thing is, is like, don't be afraid to be wrong, right? You know, share your ideas, make bets, place bets on your ideas, because everybody's wrong. The only people who aren't wrong are the people who aren't trying, who are trying to hide out and, and avoid things. But it's better to keep trying because one of the, all you need is one really good idea to come through. And the more you observe and the more you share those ideas, the better you become at identifying ideas and taking chances and understanding what ideas are going to work in the marketplace and which ones aren't going to work. But if you don't keep trying, you never figure that out. Well, I want to disavow everybody here who listens to this of any notion that Dave and myself, uh, definitely me, have all the answers by a long shot. Um, we're, we're just kind of uh, one step ahead in some respects, and we're like four steps behind most you know, we're, we're, we're stumbling around in the dark. At least four. We've got our, we, 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 yeah, yeah. We've got our, we, we've got our torch and sometimes our torch shines in the right direction. Okay. So do not under any circumstances go and say, these guys sound like they got it all together. That, that's actually not what we're saying. What we're saying is we've kind of fought, you know, struggled with ourselves going, uh, yeah, okay, maybe. And, and, you know, it's, it's like five steps forwards and 10 steps back on a much more regular basis and, and, and getting used to that and, 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 and fighting internally in yourself going, when you hear yourself going, this has got to work, Dave, this, is, this one is the one that's going to work. You know, uh, if you hear yourself saying that, you go, no, no, what I'm doing is placing small bets. And, and you know, I, I really struggle with this then because I'm not a gambling person. I don't like gambling. And I'm a little bit of a sort of person who's going to do all the research and then I, 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 I do the thing. Yeah. And you know, it's not helpful. I have to keep reminding myself. It's not like, it's like having a shower. Just because I had a shower this morning doesn't mean I don't have to have a shower this morning, uh, tomorrow morning. Yeah? <laughs> I have to keep reminding myself that this is something I need to do. This is not something that's one and done. Where Dave and myself are sitting there going, yep, we're already reached the outer outer limits of, of development as an individual. We know exactly what we're doing. No, no, we're, we're the person reminding ourselves to have a shower every day as well. Yeah, making it up as I go along. And it's those people who are sitting there telling you that they have all the answers and there's only one right way. Those are the people who are lying to you. 
Yeah, unless, of course, you are the head of Formula One, I actually do have all the answers and you just need to call me, call one 800 for you, then uh, I'll have all the correct answers for you straight away immediately. Yeah, or if you need, uh, the, the Premier League needs somebody to work on revenue, I'm uh, completely, in, you know, I know everything. <laughs> I've got all the answers. I've got all yeah, the answers. Exactly. Yeah, I know everything. So, Colin, how can people find you on the internet? Uh, okay, well, uh, pretty easy. Just find me on the Twitter machine, uh, and it's Colin A. Lewis, as in a big A in the middle, because some other sucker took Colin Lewis. So Colin A. Lewis, you'll find me on Twitter. If you search me Colin Lewis Marketing on Google, you will find me in Marketing Week or on my own website, which is a work in progress called www.colinlewis.me. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was sort of suitably egotistical to have Colin Lewis dot me. Uh, and if you email me on Colin at Colin Lewis dot me, and uh, if you wish to send a large check with like seven zeros, you can do that via the internet on Colin at Colin Lewis dot me. <laughs> well, Colin, thank you so much for doing the podcast. Man. No, thank you for your time, Doug. It's been fun. Well, what did you think about my conversation with Colin? Let me know. Send me an email. It's Dave at DaveWakeman.com. You can check out my website. That's DaveWakeman.com where you'll find out my what I'm up to. You'll find my blog. You'll find all kinds of great stuff there. So check that out, DaveWakeman.com. Make sure you can connect with me on the social media platforms. I'm on LinkedIn where you can just search Dave Wakeman. You'll find me. Or I'm on the Twitter where you can find me at David Wakeman. Uh, as I mentioned before, make sure you check out my Talking Tickets newsletter. That's at talkingtickets.substack.com. And there's a second newsletter that I do that comes out on Sundays. It's all about strategy and marketing called The Business of Value. And you can get that at businessofvalue.substack.com. Make sure that you check out my friends at We Will Recover. Uh, the We Will Recover.live is the website. It's a project put together by the Activity Stream team led by Anar and Martin. Uh, it's great. There's organizations from around the world putting ideas, content, all kinds of stuff together to help you recover. That's the whole point of the website. Uh, I have a couple of new webinar ideas that are going to be posted over the next couple days. It's great. Check it out. It's going to be awesome. We're going to talk about customer orientation. Uh, the B2B sales funnel for folks in sports. We're also going to talk about uh, rebuilding your marketing strategy. Um, and we're going to talk about the holy trinity of marketing, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. It's going to be awesome stuff, so keep an eye out on the We Will Recover Live website. Also check out my friends at Booking Protect. Uh, they are the global leaders in refund protection. If you have been thinking about it or you've been thinking about ways to rebuild trust with your customers because they're a little skittish due to the pandemic or you've just been looking for ways to insulate your organization in case of challenges when events can be put on or you can have events again, um, refund protection might be a great idea right now. So check them out at bookingprotect.com forward slash home. You can also check out the blog. There's some great stuff right now as I'm recording this. We are in the middle of customer service week at Booking Protect. So check it out. Some great things there. Um, I know that I'm personally working on something around digital ticketing and contactless ticketing um, and all of these tools that will be valuable to people going forward. So there's some great stuff there. Check it out. Make sure you keep on top of things. Um, if I didn't mention it at the start, I shouldn't mention it now. Uh, make sure if you're American, check to make sure you're registered to vote. Make a plan to vote and participate. America has one of the lowest voter participation rates of any uh, rich country in the world. Uh, and this year, as you've seen, it's very important that people vote. I think it's always very important. Uh, I have been as much as possible supporting an organization called IVotedConcerts.com. Uh, one named Emily White put this thing together. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, and the organization is doing great work. Um, go visit IVotedConcerts.com and find out how to vote. Make sure your vote is casted and do your thing, okay? Go do it. And before I let you go, uh, first of all, thank you for continuing to be here. But if anybody needs me, uh, it, just as a voice to talk to or um, you, you're struggling, make sure you send me a note. Uh, Dave at DaveWakeman.com. I'm happy to be there, here to talk or support anybody any way I can right now. I know everybody's struggling in one shape, one shape or form, uh, and I don't want you to have to go through this thing alone. So uh, don't hesitate to send me a note, an email, a text, uh, whatever, right? Hit me up. 
Uh, let me know how you're doing. And if you need to talk, I'm here for you. Okay. But until next time, take it easy. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye.